Hi, I'm doing another MG Rover K-Series rebuild and I thought it'd be useful to share a few do's and don'ts because it's a continuous learning process doing things on cars and a few little extra things I've learned this time I thought I'd pass on as well as uh, some of the old ones. So I've done a couple of videos already on making the K-Series more reliable on different head gaskets and uh, cleaning out the hydraulic tappets etc. Um, so first of all, let's go through the don'ts because the previous owner of this uh, Freeland with the K-Series, uh, to be honest, made a bit of a mess of the previous engine build. So don'ts, don't, first of all, over skim the head because this head is way under the height specification. Now, sometimes you can get away with it, sometimes you can't. Uh, the previous owner had started a turbo conversion on this. I think he bought the engine from somebody else so it probably was used in a turbo configuration at, at some point uh, based on the look of the piston but we'll come to that later uh, you can see it's been vastly over skimmed so that is about a millimeter less than what it should be it is yeah hun under 118 because normally you'll have this little semicircle indentation which you can just about see at one end very flat virtually level with the surface the other end of the head has completely disappeared so that's an indication that not only has it been skimmed a lot, maybe up to about five times, but also it's been skimmed more at one end of the head than the other, which isn't great. And in fact, this end of the head, this cylinder was the one that was detonating a lot and then the melted piston, not surprisingly. Uh, you can get um, thicker shims to put in these heads to try and save them, but if you can, get a head that's within the height specification. And there's quite a lot on eBay at the moment. Uh, you should be able to get a decent one for a couple hundred quid. I managed to get this one for 62, with a little bit of damage, but uh, very usable. The other big don't is don't use uh, silicon seal, and certainly not lots of silicon seal, in between the uh, cam ladder and the head. You can see here, the previous owner put far too much thick silicon seal on the ladder, and this is where we have holes that feed the oil. This is the oil channel here. You can see all the silicon has gone into it. And there's a hole here that goes down and feeds oil to the hydraulic uh, tappet, which I've taken off, but it's basically in here. That should be able to see, yeah, there's, there's the built hole where the oil comes out. So from there up to there is a hole. Here you can see it, there it's open. This one is practically closed. That one's practically completely closed. Uh, yeah, that's probably closed. Mm, a few others are very severely restricted. It's also restricting the oil, actually spreading down the head as well. So this is a complete disaster. Also, you'll have little bits of silicon loose on the inside, which could get all around your engines and so on, blocking other oil pathways. What you should be using, and I suppose this is coming on to a do, is Loctite 574 which is a flange sealant and you shouldn't have silicon all spreading out around the edges like that or this sort of sealant. See my other video of making the K-series more, more reliable for how you apply that sealant but basically you spread it very very thinly. Uh, the manual recommends doing it via a roller. You can, and it's sometimes better just to spread it out carefully with your finger. You can see how very little sealant you should have coming out. This is on the factory built head so you can see the sealant there and is the sort of colour of Loctite 574. But very little is oozing out around the edges, virtually nothing around the side, but you can see it's, it's actually there and it's doing its job, keeping the oil in pathways, but uh, it's not, not so much that it, that it blocks all your oil pathways. And you can also see here, the sealant has come up right to the oil channel, probably completely filled it, and here, and it is therefore restricting the oil onto the camshaft bearings and maybe prematurely wearing your camshafts as well. So that is a big no-no. Use the proper sealant and not silicon and don't put too much on. Now the next don't, which is a bit unusual but specific to this car, is don't just bolt on a turbo onto a standard 1.8 K-series engine or other size and expect to get away with it um, because after, after having after having dismantled this car, this is the result, a melted piston to put state of that. So this is also a standard piston, the edge of the piston is melted and it's actually blasted molten aluminium through the oil holes 
onto the top of the con rod and you can see all the positives on the top there and also underneath the piston. Uh, I picked up the car quite cheaply. Um, the previous owner had started a Freelander turbo conversion. I think the original engine was used on the ZR, but it was a standard engine, I with normal compression. Uh, was, there's a lot of discussion as to where you can get away with buttoning a turbo on if you have enough squish and swirl and so on. I'm not an expert on it. But since the uh, manufacturer lowered the compression ratio by using these lower compression corner rods, that's the part number if you're interested. 410 engine, that's the standard conrod part number. Uh, they uh, turbo conrods are about two millimeters shorter, so provides a useful lowering of the compression ratio to stop detonation. I ran it for uh, ooh, probably about half an hour or something, odd little 10 miles journey. Um, after I'd built up the engine, I thought I'll just risk and see what happens with uh, the standard engine not doing the conversion to the shorter conrods. Uh, it used to make a little bit of a knocking from coals, which seems to disappear later, which was probably this piston on the way out and it was already damaged. Uh, and eventually it got worse and worse and uh, I dismantled the engine. So really that's just for interest. But if you want to do it properly, do a turbo conversion, then you want to change to the slightly stronger turbo pistons. See the indents in the top of the valves are slightly less which means the edges are a little bit stronger. See there, the edge completely disappeared. Ideally, you want to go for a set of these shorter con rods. I managed to pick this up second hand uh, from a guy on Facebook, actually. Very useful. Thank you, Pete. A uh, set of the 160 turbo pistons, which are so slightly stronger. Last thing I would say on don'ts is don't ignore any bad indents in the head. See here, there's a few on the old head. And that actually had a head saver shim and a multi-layer steel gasket, which is here. Slightly different design to ones I've seen before. With a firing, and to stop that um, digging into the head, they've got this head saver stainless steel shim. But unfortunately, what's happened is even with this so-called head saver shim, um, the edge of it has bent over where it's been pushed by the firing, and that edge of the shim has still pushed into the head and made a bit of an indent. Unless that was done previously by another gasket and they haven't bothered uh, skimming it in between. So normally if you've got enough head height, you should uh, get a small um, skim of the head, 0.2 of a mil or something, and be careful you don't skim it too much. Uh, there's multi-level steel ones, apparently are a little bit thicker, so it gives you a bit more margin than the elastomer ones. And the other don't is don't ignore Odd little bits of corrosion, scratches or indents in the aluminium of the block as well. See this one's been uh, scratched by a previous owner. Got a little bit of corrosion on the edge there as well, which is where it was previously seeping from. Uh, Degrease that and put a bit of sealant on it. And again, the Loctite 574 is quite a good sealant for going around the edge. So what I like to use is these N-series gaskets, which are six layer multi-layer steel. Uh, with some sort of sealing covering on it. Try not to get oil or anything on it. So that's the first of our list of do's. Do use the N-series gasket if you can. And it's best to use that where you have some cylinder line of protrusion. Uh, I have in the past used it where it's been flat um, and the engine has been okay for a few years at least. But people say that uh, if you're not gonna change the line height, then it's better to use the elastomer um, cylinder head gasket which is a bit more forgiving which is uh, probably true. The next do is do use the PRT thermostat, the external thermostat that helps with the temperature cycling of the engine and improves or reduces the stress on the engine. You'll need to take out the thermostat which is in this housing at the back. Um, either cut a big hole in the thermostat or put a blanking plate back in its place. The next do is do use the stronger oil rail ladder which looks like this and helps to um, reduce the flex on the engine. If you're taking the pistons out, then it's worthwhile checking the balance on them, uh, especially if you're replacing one or two pistons, maybe one is uh, worn or whatever, then uh, the balance can be quite different. And um, get yourself some digital scales. I read that the factory balance, I think it said was around about eight or nine grams between pistons, which is quite a lot. Obviously, uh, 
the lower the difference in the weight of the pistons the better these scales i've got uh, although they're uh, quite accurate for kitchen use their resolution is only one gram i think you can get 0.1 gram resolution scales um, but i've got a little bit of matching to do on these these pistons were bought as a set but there's a slight difference in uh, weight between them so i'm gonna grind a little bit off probably around the end parts uh, it's probably fairly safe and uh, see if we can get the weights the same obviously you have to weigh them with the rings um, and you might as well gap the rings first as well and then, and that leads us on to the other thing if you have got the uh, rings and pistons out then you want to measure the gap between the uh, the end of the rings so you want to position the rings down the bore use a piston that hasn't got any rings in so you make sure it's pushed in flush and you want it about 20 centimeters now from the top which is something like that and then get a feeler gauge in between the ends of the uh, rings uh, for a turbo engine people recommend about 0.5 mil for the top ring 0.6 mil for the second ring down um, for a non-turbo uh, it's in the Haynes manual and is around 0.3 mil for the top and around 0.3 to 0.4 mil for the second and use a little uh, Dremel uh, grinding wheel carefully removing a little bit off the edge of the ring and retesting it uh, in terms of locating the uh, piston rings then uh, there's a little tiny notch on the second ring that goes to the bottom uh, I didn't find that recess on the top ring so I don't think the Hings manual is quite correct there and uh, nor do the uh, oil compression rings look like that but I think this is generally correct top ring is positioned there that's the front of the engine to the left second ring there oil control rings there and I think they're talking about the joint in the uh, compression spring the oil control spring there trial fitted the liners and I'm just using the new oil ladder just to check they're all flat and uh, to check how much they protrude which is uh, something like about fourth hour they might squash down a bit more once it's all fully tightened when you're refitting the pistons make sure you align them the correct way so the standard ones have got a, well they've all got an arrow on which points to the front of the engine front of the engine they call the end that uh, on the case here is over this end where the belts are uh, I think that uh, description of front and rear comes from uh, when cars were car engines were fitted longitudinal and the transmission end would be called the uh, rear end. If you've got the head off then it's probably worthwhile cleaning up the tappets, hydraulic tappets. You have to remove the camshaft ladder to do that. I've got another video on cleaning hydraulic tappets and uh, a more extensive one on removing the head and rebuilding it which is uh, the video on making the case series more reliable. It's probably worth doing, a little bit time consuming, but should remove any little tapping noises, hopefully, if you clean them properly. If for any reason you want to rotate the engine, then do make sure you use liner clamps, which you can make up yourself. Uh, I've made a few in preparation here. So just use some copper pipe, all sorts of different washers that I found around uh, the garage. So. You can use these, these are 99 mil long, roughly. And with the right size washer, let's say there, you can have it just over the liners. That'll go on top. You then put the original cylinder head bolt with the washer through there, down into the oil rail ladder at the bottom. And uh, that will uh, either push in the liners or hold them in place if you need to rotate the engine. Uh, because these liners are slide fit, there's always the possibility that they will move when the pistons are moving. Another do is make sure you use these steel dowels. Uh, some engines have plastic ones. There's two of them. They go into the holes in the block there and over there in the head. There's also similar holes. Uh, if your head has been uh, skimmed rather a lot and you insist on using it, um, it's also worth checking the depth of the hole versus the height of the dowel sticking out. So I've heard of some stories about the dowel actually stopping the head being tightened down sufficiently. So I managed to pick what is apparently a new head up from eBay. The old style head for the manual tensioner. Uh, the input port's a very slightly different shape, rather the same width. 
and this one did have a little bit of damage to the thread on the side so it cracks the aluminium around the top uh, but there's quite a lot more that you can drill in to uh, the aluminium so what I did is uh, made a, a longer stud drilled in tapped it and um, it's um, perfectly secure. If you do get one of these older style heads you'll notice that the bolt positions on the side are in a different position. Um, so it had a bolt hole here which I've blocked off with a piece of silicon and two holes here and here which I've blocked off with uh, bolts. Um, at least one of these penetrates into the oil way, so don't forget to block it off, otherwise you'll have oil coming out. So this head was designed for the manually adjustable tensioner, whereas my original head was for the automatic tensioner, and these are the holes for the automatic tensioner. So that hole is for the bolt that holds the spring, so I had to drill a hole and tap it in exactly the same position. And see the difference here? This is the hole that actually holds the automatic tensioner. Again, I had to drill that one. The other difference you'll find because of these different hole positions is that on the later style head you'll have an extra piece of metal. You see it in there just in that hole where my finger is pointing. Whereas on the older style you don't have that piece of uh, metal extra casting. Which means when you drill this hole it might just protrude into the oil way. So when you put your bolt on for the automatic tensioner put some thread locker or other sealant on it which you probably want anyhow to stop your automatic tensioner coming undone. And as an extra precaution, I've just spread a little bit of uh, metal resin sealant over the hole. Not really necessary, but double precaution. I uh, use this pretty good stuff, JB Weld, very hard. It stands up to 5,000 PSI. I've seen some reconditioned heads for sale on eBay where all of these holes are opened up. So uh, be very careful using another head that's got double holes because certainly um, these two need blocking. Um, one of them is, uh, as I say, open into the oil way. Supposedly this head has never been skimmed. You can check the height of the cylinder head, which should be 119 centimeters plus or minus uh, 0.05. So, so try and measure it in a few places. Uh, this one, interestingly, comes out at about 118.75. So it should be uh, 119 plus or minus 0.05. Um, 18.75 is the minimum height that is acceptable for the K series, uh, which normally allows for one skim. So although it doesn't look like it's had a skim, it's possible that it might have done. Certainly, it doesn't look like a skimmed uh, surface on it, but at least it's within the uh, recommended height. Also worth checking for any flashing that's around the casting holes for the water flow inside the head. So these holes here, here, and so on, and all the way around. Uh, this, this, head, this head just had a little bit of flashing, so I just opened them up a little bit just to remove the flashing. Not really changing uh, how it's been designed, because uh, the hole at the end seems a bit smaller deliberately. Probably try and match the uh, water flow correctly. Um, but where it's just obvious flashing, then I don't see any harm in removing those and uh, that should help the water flow a little bit better as well. So uh, to wash this head off in the end, I used a combination of uh, water jet, um, airline and uh, brake cleaner spray. Um, so and a little bit of wiping around the valves to remove any of that um, metal grinding. Obviously be careful you don't get water in any of the um, oil pathways, not a good idea. The liners slide in and out quite easily once all the gunk and everything has been removed. The liner itself has been degreased, the block and the edge has been degreased also, so they go in nicely. There's your uh, shim that I've used on this engine. If we actually look here at the edge of the aluminium block, you can see a little ridge where my finger is there. You can see the aluminium has actually been pushed or has sunk down as a result of the heating and cooling and that's where we've lost our three thou of uh, liner protrusion. It's the aluminium of the block that has pulled away. Uh, probably that is um, not helped by the fact that these liners are a slide fit. 
not uh, an interference fit. So there's going to be a little bit of a gap in between the liner and the block. Uh, so that allows perhaps the aluminium to spread sideways a little bit because the metal's got to go somewhere if it's sinking down and it allows it to sink. Uh, you can recover these blocks rather than scrap the whole block. You can get a uh, little four thou shims, you see there, I've got a shim on it. And they're only about 35 pounds or something. Uh, so if we seal both edges of the uh, shim, when we put it back in, uh, then that should allow us to recover the block. So sealing around these, you have to put uh, seal it around here to stop obviously the water getting into the oil. Uh, two different stories I read. Um, a lot of people seem to recommend High Lamar Blue. And in fact, I've seen that at a workshop manual, they recommend that. Uh, but in other workshop manual and the Haynes manual, I've also seen them recommend uh, one of the Land Rover sealants, STC 50552, which actually when you Google it, uh, look it up for actually buying it on Rimmers or, some, or something like that, it comes out as Loctite uh, 243. This stuff, uh, which is a uh, thread locker, it's like an adhesive sealant. I'm sure you could use either, probably a few pros and cons to each. If you're thinking you're going to change the liners in the future at some point, then use Hylomar because it's a little bit softer, a little bit more flexible. Whereas the thread locker being an adhesive sealer uh, is going to be a little bit harder. Uh, might help uh, locate the liner onto the block a bit more uh, thoroughly perhaps. Um, or even though of course it's squashed in between the block and the head. Personal preference, how you fit the pistons later, whether you do it after fitting the liners and sticking them in place. Um, I think I'm going to fit the pistons to the liners and fit them all as one piece. Uh, the slight advantage being that you can keep an eye on the, um, particularly the oil control rings, which are very thin. And I'm just going to push them in place rather than use a pistons, piston ring compressor, where you don't actually get to see the rings and you just pop the piston in. Um, um, you can just fit the uh, piston with the rings just by pushing the rings in gently, applying some pressure to the piston. Uh, the advantage is you can see each ring go smoothly into the liner by doing that. Because what I did notice on some of the other pistons, some second hand ones that I bought, is um, the ring being very thin, one or two of them had actually bent over the edge of the piston. Uh, whether that was, uh, whether that happened as, as part of its running or um, I suspect it might have happened due to poor fitting. Another thing on the definitely do list is uh, check the metal pipes or any other fittings for leaks. So uh, this um, pipe at the rear is quite difficult to see in uh, when the engine is normally assembled up. And on my old one, I had a quick look at it. it looked a bit rusty and when I poked it with the screwdriver, this little hole opened up. So it may have been starting to leak and seep previously. Um, got a replacement part, second hand part on eBay quite cheaply. So that is definitely worth doing. And the other thing I think for long term longevity is worth doing is checking over the expansion tank. Uh, this one is at the top of. You can see it's got lots of uh, cracks around the top. That one's quite a bad one on the seam there. A little bit bulged around those cracks. I suspect it may have been leaking a little bit. And uh, because you've got quite a small amount of water in the K-series, you want to make sure you've got no water leaks around. And the other thing you want to do is, uh, ideally, is put some sort of water level sensor on there. So I've done a couple of videos on retrofitting water level sensors to the K-series engine and one on the Freelander. You can put a little uh, float device, basically drill a hole through, put a little floating switch in there and wire that up to a sounder or an LED inside the car, which will tell you uh, when your water level is getting low. This time I decided to go for a slightly more advanced water level sensing uh, method. Uh, got this second hand expansion bottle from eBay, it's from uh, VW Tiguran. Has a water level sensing connection already on it, which is actually an electronic sensor. Actually inside the tank, it's just two wires that poke into water. And to that, you have to attach some electronic circuit. Um, and there are little modules that fit in production cars. So I've just ordered one of those. And I'll do a little video on uh, doing a better water level sensor for the Freelander later on. Hopefully that'll work when I get the sensor. 
Um, the advantage of an electronic water level sensing is that uh, it doesn't rock around so much like a uh, float switch does, which uh, bobs up and down with the water level, swings from one side of the car to the other as you're um, going around the corner and so on. The little thing that's probably worth doing is plugging this uh, water hole over here. This doesn't actually go anywhere in the manifold, but does uh, have water sitting in it. And I did notice even on the MG6 manifold that I've got, there was a very slight bit of marking on the manifold itself of um, a bit of white marking that shows um, water was leaking out very, very slightly. Um, the inlet manifold gasket, the rubber manifold gasket was uh, slightly bent around this area. Um, so just sealing it with a silicon plug, allowing it to dry before you put the head back on. Uh, it's probably not a bad idea and certainly can't do any harm and should prevent any leak. Uh, do a similar thing on the inlet manifold itself. Make sure it doesn't protrude above the surface. And the only other thing that comes to mind on this very quick video is check overall condition of your belts. Uh, so there's a couple of belts that I've removed uh, where they're really bad, like here. Lots of cracks when you bend it the other way. That obviously needs replacing and I've got a new belt to fix that. Better to replace it now than wait till it snaps, potentially creating a lot of damage. So that's it on my very quick list of do's and don'ts. Extra things that occurred to me that are worth sharing uh, on the K-Series engine build. Uh, good luck with yours and uh, hopefully at some point I'll do a video on converting a Freelander to a 1.8 turbo engine upgrading it to 200 horsepower just for interest later on okay thanks for watching bye